So, a happy Earth Day for me. And thank you, Phil, Seattle University, and the Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability for this opportunity to share with you some of the key ideas from my most recent book, Change the Story, Change the Future. That is the key theme. It is the foundation of moving from a suicide economy for framed by money-seeking corporate robots living in a dead rock, <laughs> to turning to a living economy for living beings, living human beings, born of and nurtured by a living earth, itself born of a living universe. And that changes everything. It's exactly the topic we should be discussing on this Earth Day. This is the 45th anniversary of Earth Day. As you know, the first Earth Day was in 1970. That was just two years after we got the first photograph of Earth back from space. That image that has changed forever how we see ourselves. Three months after Earth Day celebration in 1970, President Nixon established the Environmental Protection Agency. Two years after the first Earth Day, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the Coastal Zone Management Act, and it banned DDT. And that same year, Dennis and Danella Meadows published the Limits to Growth Study, the report to the Club of Rome. Four years after the first Earth Day, Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act. So here we are at the 45th anniversary. We, were, we are in the early stages, early stages, we're basically into environmental collapse of many systems, severe climate, warming, prolonged droughts. We're poisoning ourselves with toxic substances dug up from deep in the earth. We have the greatest inequality in society since before the financial crash of 1929. And we have a government in the pockets of money-seeking, these money-seeking corporate robots. And they fight for tax breaks, subsidies, and relief from any legislation that might favor the well-being of people and nature over corporate profits. So we live under corporate rule in a suicide economy that is destroying the foundations of its own existence. Now, I know you're all here because you're fully aware of this reality. And I see no reason to further dampen your day by giving you a lot of statistics about how bad it is. That would be redundant. But I want to start, I'm absolutely fascinated by the recognition that what we're experiencing are the consequences of living in violation of an ancient, a very familiar ancient teaching. You've all heard it. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, I think of God as living spirit, the animating spirit of life, of creation. So it really comes down to you cannot serve both life and money. It's a basic choice. Do we organize the economy to exploit life to make money, which turns out to be specifically money for rich people, or do we organize the economy using money as a useful accounting system, but designing the economy in service of people and nature, uh, more broadly, in service to the living community, the living Earth community. And one of the themes I will keep bringing in is we get deeper and deeper into our understanding of life. We recognize life can exist only in community. And as you understand at the deeper level how life organizes, Life is constantly organizing to maintain the conditions on this, this planet essential to the existence of life. Living community 
creating the conditions essential to its own existence. So we got a lot to cover tonight. Uh, oh, actually, I wanted to, <laughs> anytime I stray, stray from my notes, I leave out critical pieces. Um, very significant that we meet here in a Jesuit university. As you all know, Pope Francis is a Jesuit. I'm very taken by the point from his recent homily about money. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy truly lacking in human purpose. It's interesting that the Pope understands the economy much better than most economists do. <laughs> Basically what he's saying is, you know, we've all heard the phrase, money is evil. Essentially saying money is not evil. It's the worship of money that is evil. The worship of money is a false god. And as I will get into, we have literally developed an economy around the worship of money. Now, we're going to cover a lot of complex issues tonight. Um, I want you to be aware it all comes down to simple principles in the end. And the interesting thing about it is these principles live in the human heart. They are principles with which we are born. They are principles that were well understood by the earliest humans, so far as we know, back to the time when the human consciousness first emerged. So it's, they're not new. You'll recognize them. You know them. They live in your heart. The difficulty is that these simple, self-evident truths are all fundamentally contrary to what we are normally taught through most of our educational system and through most of corporate media. Our challenge, in the words of the Earth Charter, let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life. Now, this is why I'm so excited to be speaking at this university, Seattle University, a Jesuit university. Because a critical challenge of our time is to come up with a new sacred story for humanity, a new story by which we understand at the most fundamental level our origin the nature and purpose of creation and our place within creation. And it needs to be a story that draws from all of the sources of human knowledge and experience. So from indigenous wisdom, from religious teaching, from scientific understanding and, and discovery, and our daily experience. We have this problem that in contemporary society we have no place, no institutional home, no institutional place for the deep examination of our most fundamental stories. And this is a time when we desperately need that. And my sense is that our Jesuit universities may be the most promising uh, place for that conversation because the Jesuit universities honor both the teachings of science and the teachings of religion and the understandings of indigenous wisdom. And they have the intellectual horsepower and the curiosity to bring these together in a new conversation. Anyhow, we have big, big changes to navigate. Not only a shift from money to life is our defining value, but also from corporate rule to true democracy. Deep change begins with a new vision, a vision grounded in a new story. So we will discuss an essential but neglected key to the path ahead to move out of our desperate failure with the environment and our desperate uh, social failures and our governance failures. All comes around the story, which is the least discussed, perhaps, aspect of our current human tragedy. 
I began my search for a new story for our time uh, with this, this observation from Thomas Berry, his book, The Dream of the Earth, the Catholic theologian. I think I read it about 1994. It was at the time I was writing when corporations rule the world. Thomas says, for people generally, their story of the universe and the human role in the universe is their primary source of intelligibility and value. The deepest crises experienced by any society are those moments of change when its story becomes inadequate for meeting the survival demands of a present situation. That is our, that, that is our situation. When we get our story wrong, we get our future wrong, and we have our story badly wrong. So we need to understand, you know, we humans are a species of many, many possibilities. You know, when we talk about our human nature, we define our human nature in many different ways. But to me, the, def the true defining aspect of our human nature is our ability to choose our nature in large measure. We can choose to be violent, greedy, individualistic, destructive. We can also choose to be cooperative, caring, and giving. It's a choice. Now, in a sense, we, in reality, we choose it collectively through our choice of common story. But it's because we have all these possibilities, it is basically impossible for us to live together unless we find a common story within our group that defines, okay, what are our shared values? What are our, our shared assumptions about the nature of reality, about the proper relationship between humans and between humans and Earth? And if we lack an authentic story, we are easily manipulated into a fabricated story. And this is a critical part of our history. Since the beginning of empire some 5,000 years ago, the rulers have known that the foundation of their power depends on shaping the framing story of the society to support and legitimate their rule. That's exactly what we have now, rule by corporations, and corporations and corporate interests shaping our framing story to support and legitimate their rule. Now, one of, one of my introductions into the actual power of stories came back in 1999 here in Seattle. It was just before the Seattle WTO demonstrations. And the Seattle Council of Churches organized a community gathering uh, to orient the faith community of Washington State and the Seattle area to what was coming up in terms of these meetings and the demonstrations and what was at stake. And I was a speaker at that conference along with Marcus Borg, a Jesus scholar. Uh, are any of you here, were, at the, were any of you at that gathering before the WTO? Yeah, just a few. It's a, not, not so many of us are uh, us elders in this particular group. <laughs> Anyhow, I have never forgotten Marcus's defining statement. He said, tell me your image of God and I will tell you your politics. Tell me your image of God, and I will tell you your politics. He goes on to explain, there are two primary images of God in the Christian Bible. One is the anthropomorphic patriarch. The God created in our image, who is an elder male like me. I, I can't imagine who would have written that story. <laughs> it sets up a hierarchy of domination. Who is closest to that God? That God who is all-powerful and all-knowing. So what's the hierarchy then? So, uh, and of course, you know, part of it that comes out is... Uh, is men are over women, women are over children, maybe they're all over people of color, 
over animals, et cetera, et cetera. But who's closest to God? Who has, who does God favor? Which obviously is the rich and powerful. Well, that's interesting. He says the other image is the spirit image. The spirit manifests through all creation, through all being. He said, now that image sets up a very different frame for society. We are all connected. We are all interrelated. We are all part of the same expression. Wow, now there's the foundation for democracy, for true community. So that really burned itself into my consciousness in terms of the power of our stories and the extent to which, in some ways, very simple variations in what on their surface are very simple stories can have profound effects in society. Then another defining experience. In March 2012, it was just before the Rio Plus 20 conference, environmental conference. And I had the privilege of being invited to a retreat, a small retreat with a group of international indigenous environmental leaders. And they were talking about their role in preparing for the, uh, that Earth Summit. And they noted that mainstream corporate interests were saying, yes, we must protect nature. Nature is very valuable. But to protect her, we have to put a price on her. Oh. They said, well, if we put a price on her, then the richest buy her, right? So we privatize, we commodify, we securitize, and of course the whole Wall Street agenda was to get that all set up. So, you know, the, the, the mortgage thing had, had, had gone bust, so they wanted a new set of derivatives to uh, play their financial games around. And the indigenous leaders said, no. Earth is our sacred earth mother. She cannot be for sale. No matter how much money we can make off of her, we must absolutely protect and maintain her health and integrity. Wow. Very different approach. Uh, one, of the, one of the participants in that was Car Karma Satim who is the head of the Gross National Happiness Commission in Bhutan. So he gave us, you all know Bhutan on the Gross National Happiness Indicator and so forth. Um, so he ended his short talk with three words. Time is life. Time is life. Does that strike any of you as a little unusual? Any of you here in the business school? What do they teach you about time is in the business school? <laughs> time is money. Time is money. That's what my daddy taught me. That's what I took on a course on internal discounted rates of return. And then I went to business school. The whole curriculum is built around time is money. But wow. What if time is life? What if time is for living? What if not money is just a number, an accounting entry? And we're organizing our lives around accumulating accounting chits. And that is what we're doing. And we are destroying life to make money. I ask myself, is there intelligent life on Earth? <laughs> as, I, as I'll go on with the stories, I'm absolutely convinced there is intelligent life on Earth, but we still have to prove that we humans are an intelligent species. Anyhow, it all relates to the fact that our established stories are partial, incomplete, and the corporate interests fill the gap with what I call a sacred money and market story. These are essential elements. Listen very closely to these elements and calculate in your mind. Is that statement true or false? Time is money. 
Money is wealth. Making money creates wealth. Making money is the defining purpose of people, business, and the economy. The rich are obviously society's wealth creators. Affluent lifestyles are their fair and just reward. Material consumption drives prosperity and is the path to happiness. Poverty is a consequence of laziness. The earth belongs to us. It is our human nature to be individualistic, competitive, and acquisitive. And guided by the invisible hand of the free market, these beneficial qualities unleash the creative potential of humanity to grow the economy, to create wealth, end poverty, and drive the technological innovation required to eliminate our human dependence on nature. The community interest is simply an aggregation of the individual private interests of its individual members. We therefore all do best when we each focus on maximizing our own individual private interest. Corporations are just groups of people working in common cause to create wealth for us all. They are the engines of wealth creation and entitled to the same rights as any person. This is the story we live by, the story we're taught. Did you notice anything in that statement that was true? Every single element of that story is either false or grossly misleading. Maximizing returns to money absolutely guarantees an ever-increasing concentration of wealth and an ever-growing gap between those who control great wealth and those who don't and are increasingly excluded as those on the top monopolize control of our access to the basic means of living. You control our basic means, access to a basic means of living, you totally control the society. So why do we accept this story, this obviously false story? Well, part of it is our partial and outdated cosmologies, each of which has a contribution to make to our deeper understanding, but each of which is inadequate in itself. Now, there's three, identify three basic stories. There's the distant patriarch story that I mentioned before, there's the grand machine story of science, and there is the story of the mystical unity. Now think of each of these in terms of its message about agency, the ability to act, the ability to influence, to do, to choose. Relationships, how we, the nature of our relationships with each other and with nature. And meaning or purpose, the meaning and purpose of, of life, of our existence. So the distant patriarch, all agency resides with the patriarch who lives apart. So if things aren't going well here, the obvious solution is to pray to God to fix it. Now our primary relationship, my primary relationship, is to him. Because the key, the meaning of my life, is to get on his good side to get a good place in the afterlife. So it's not about fixing anything here. I, I once heard uh, a woman who was of the, uh, the rapture tradition on the radio say, I think of my life here on Earth as just a short stay over in a cheap hotel. Well, you don't set about to try to repair the cheap hotel when you're just staying overnight. Um, so this pretty much relieves us of responsibility. Now, the grand machine story is that the whole of the universe is like a giant clockworks. Uh, maybe there was a god or the clockmaker that set it up and set it in motion. But basically, it's just a mechanism winding down to a heat death as its spring unwinds. So if you take this story literally, there is no agency. There may have been agency way at the beginning, but the rest of it is just playing out. Everything is related, but it's like billiard balls bouncing off one another or the gears in a clock. Meaning? There is absolutely no meaning. Wow. 
That is depressing. I think I'll go shopping. And that's, that's not a facetious connection. It very much plays into that. Uh, then there's a mystical unity story. The reality is all, the, real, the only true reality is the mystical unity, the, the spirit. That what we perceive as reality is simply an illusion created of the ego. And that is the cause of our suffering and separation. So through meditative practice, our goal should be to get rid of the ego, meld into the oneness, and essentially get out of all this pain. Now that's also interesting because it really, there is no particular meaning to existence in that story. Uh, relationships all sort of ev dissolve because it's all just uh, an undifferentiated unity. Agency is kind of irrelevant. So there we have three stories, each partial, none of which that I can see offers us any true guide to addressing the realities of the failures of society as we see them. Now, if we begin to put them together, however, we see a very interesting synthesis. Religion recognizes that there is agency in creation. There is consciousness, and there is intelligence. It exists in the universe, and is essential to the unfolding of the universe. Then you come to science. Well, mechanism and chance are a part of our material existence. And science gives us insights the lens into the deepest structure of reality and of creation. I mean, my field is organization from business school, and so I want to know how things organize. And, you know, in business school, you just look at how the corporation organizes to make maximum money. But if you apply that to creation, you say, wow, you look at all those, you know, particle physics, quantum physics, you look at the deepest levels of biology, these physical forms are organizing out of these particles by processes that we have scarcely the slightest understanding. And then we get into our own bodies and the, the organization of our bodies, the organization of, of life on, on Earth, all of the organisms and how they relate together. Um, we have only the barest understanding of that. But it does create a sense of wonder then you come to the mystical unity story of spirit is the ground of all creation. That all creation is a manifestation of spirit. Okay? So maybe we put these together. And what I see happening is an emerging new story. Various people are beginning to put it together into a coherent frame. But here's how I think about it. That the beginning is the spirit. The spirit that has, in a sense, some, well, we reflect some of its characteristics. At our deepest level, we have this human drive to know, to understand ourselves, to understand our purpose, the meaning of our lives. We long for that knowledge. So perhaps the spirit longed for that same knowledge. And how does it know itself? There is nothing else. By becoming. By expressing. By exploring its possibilities. So it bursts forth in this cloud of energy particles as science describes it. And these energy particles, over time, begin to find ways to connect, to come together into ever more complex atoms, and then into more complex molecules. And they form massive star systems and constellations, well, and, and 
um, and galaxies, of which we now know there are billions and billions of galaxies, with, each with billions and billions of stars. And somewhere, for some reason, on one planet around one sun, life gets a foothold. The simplest of one-cell organisms with no <laughs> cell nucleus. But over several billion years, these organisms, organizing as a planetary community, working with the deep geological forces of Earth, totally transformed the conditions on the surface of this Earth in ways that we do not find duplicated so far, have not been able to discover on any other planet. They transformed the temperature. They created the climates. They, they created the chemical composition of the air, the, the chemical composition of the sea, the, the, the cycles by which water is continuous, uh, fresh water is continuously generated. And perhaps in some ways most significant to our time, they extracted from the atmosphere excess carbons and toxins to sequester them deep underground to create the conditions on the surface of the planet essential to the existence of more complex forms of life. Now you may notice that in our advanced intelligence and technological capability we have created an economy that is devoted to taking those toxins and carbons out of from the sequestration, releasing them back into the environment for what purpose? To suppress and exploit the various dynamics of these natural living systems that are essential to maintaining the conditions for our existence. This is an act of collective suicidal insanity. Now, if we begin to get into our consciousness that Earth is a living organism, a community of life that self-organizes to maintain the conditions essential for us to exist. You get a very different perspective on how we might go about organizing our economy. You also see in the total pattern of this unfolding of creation a consistent arrow, always toward greater complexity, greater beauty, greater awareness, and greater possibility. And every being, every organism, whether simple cell or complex humans, whether a grain of sand or great mountains or great galaxies, each is contributing to the continued unfolding of the whole. Each has its place in creation. That brings us to the question, what is our human place in creation? Everything that creation creates from that perspective has a purpose. You know, Earth did not birth us so that we could exploit her and destroy her and all her children. Clearly, Earth birthed us to find our role and to participate in this continued creative unfolding. One of our most defining characteristics is our reflective consciousness, our ability to reflect back on our own consciousness and to choose our nature, to choose our story, and thereby to choose our future. You begin to get into that, you can begin to see we might really have some really interesting possibilities for contributing to this creative unfolding rather than destroying it out of our own egotistic sense that it all was created for us. So it brings us to the new framing story, the story to live by. This is not the cosmology. I'll get into it. We just sort of covered the cosmology, but this is the story that, in my view, must replace the sacred money and market story. I call it the sacred life and living earth story. Time is life. 
Real wealth is living wealth. Money is just a number, useful as a medium of exchange in well-regulated markets. We humans are living beings, born of and nurtured by living earth, itself born of a living universe, and that changes everything. Life exists only in community. We are part of nature, not apart from nature. Earth does not belong to us, we belong to Earth. Our health and prosperity depends on Earth's health and prosperity. Our human nature calls us to care and share for the benefit of all. Increasingly, brain science is discovering that that is what is actually wired into our brain. Serving the living community that sustains us is essential to community health, and that service is our source of greatest happiness. Now, this one is really interesting. If you look at this fundamental assumptions of conventional economics. Individualistic greed, ruthless competition, and violence against life are indicators of serious psychological and societal dysfunction. They're the characteristics of the psychopath and the sociopath. And yet we set it up as the ideal for economic behavior. Wow. Poverty, in reality, is most often the consequence of a lack of opportunity. The proper purpose of any human institution, whether business, government, or civil society, is to support people as productive, contributing, sharing members of a vibrant and prosperous living earth community. Corporations that seek to monopolize resources and decision-making power in the pursuit of purely financial ends have no place in a healthy society. Do I hear applause? <laughs> so, if we build from the sacred life and living earth story, we find we have the foundation for a living, to creating a living economy that organizes as life organizes to maintain and enhance the conditions for life. And that's the conditions for all life because we only survive as a community. It is also, of course, the conditions for our own lives. But it's not like environmentalism is some do-gooder cause. It's about survival. It's about discovering our true nature and our true purpose. Now, this is, this is what's a major source of hope. You know, not only the elements of that living universe story coming out in, in science research and philosophy studies and all sorts of different endeavors, even though it doesn't necessarily all come together yet, but it is emerging. The other exciting part is when you recognize that all around the world, in communities most everywhere, increasing numbers of people are organizing to bring forth a living economy. They are rebuilding their local economies. They're rebuilding their communities. They are engaging in organic agriculture or biodynamic agriculture, young people going back to the soil, creating farms that are re rebuilding the soil, that are working within community to feed themselves and feed their neighbors, starting farmers markets, um, we're, ha we're building bicycle-friendly cities. We are right here in Seattle, the center of the global living building movement, which is working to create a whole built environment that works, rather than separating us from one another and separating us from nature, connects us to one another and nature in ways that maintain the dynamic generative processes of Earth at every level. We have people or promoting constitutional amendments to strip corporations of personhood rights, campaign finance reform, living wage campaigns like here in Seattle, fighting fracking and coal trains, Sierra Club locally organizing to fight the uh, using of our port to service these shell oil ships, keep the carbon in the ground, 
We have these calls for racial justice, which is part of rebuilding the equity, equality into our society, which is absolutely essential to democracy. If you have excluded groups, if you have concentrations of power like we have now, there is no way you can have real democracy, which we are demonstrating in spades. Um, and of course, one of the you know one of the major issues right at the moment is the the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, which is this massive effort to create a advance the 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 regime of corporate rights, which puts corporations beyond the reach of law, and which absolutely it begins to actually set up rules that prohibit us from doing the things that we have to do to create a living economy. And so far, it looks like the, you know, not only our president, but also the majority of members of Congress are aligned behind that unholy cause. It includes both of our senators from the state. Now, we come back, the starting point is the new story. Now, the elements of the story are emerging, but we absolutely have to be giving it expression as we live it. An expression in a way that helps us see and share the whole and the vision of possibility of our species. And here's one of the things I've discovered. For this essential task, we have no institutional spaces in modern society devoted to the systematic examination and updating of our deepest framing stories. We have universities that have departments of religion that teach the religious stories. We have departments of science that teach the science stories. We may have some philosophy, but never do they connect. And they generally teach established stories they don't say, well, wait a minute, is this story still up to date? Can we expand it? Is it evolving? Is it adequate to the needs of our time? Does it truly reflect the breadth and depth of our human knowledge? That's not happening. Our churches are another place. Churches are the places for examining our deepest beliefs, our deepest values, and yet they simply teach dogma or catechism, mostly the, the distant patriarch story. So, that's why I'm really excited to be here at Seattle University, a Jesuit university. You put on a conference this summer, this last summer, uh, for, uh, yeah, uh, earlier, th earlier this year? Huh? August. In August. Yeah, August last year, um, which was a conference of Jesuit universities. And I'm absolutely fascinated that among our institutions, um, these institutions bring together thinking, creative thinking at the frontiers of both science and religion. And as part of the Jesuit tradition, the, in, in many ways the, the living universe story is very consistent with a lot of Jesuit thinking and teaching. There are probably no institutions anywhere that are better suited to engaging the systematic examination of where these stories come together. How can they evolve into a new story? How can we bring the pursuit, the exploration, discovery of a shared new story uh, through our faith community institutions and through our educational institutions? Tim Corrigan down here is working on just that in terms of K through 12 education. These things are beginning to happen, but this is a, an incredible opportunity for, um, for this university. And it involves both the synthesis of the truth, the, the scientific truths about mechanism, change, and the unfolding of creation, and religion, the intelligent conscious agency. It also is an exploration to take us beyond the separation of individual and community, individualism versus collectivism. You know, we grew up with taught the story, at least certainly my generation. There's only two choices. Either you're a capitalist or you're a communist. So either you're a ruthless 
thieving individual, <laughs> or you're a suppressed collectivist who loses individual identity. You know, this is the fascinating thing about looking at living systems, and it's particularly interesting when we get into understanding the human body, which is comprised of literally trillions of individual decision-making living cells, uh, trillions of which, tens of trillions of which are integral to our bodily structure, more tens of trillions of which are the microbes that are also essential to the functioning of the whole. Now take a little time sometime and think about that. We're not conscious of those individual cells. So tiny, could they be intelligent? And yet our whole existence, our whole function depends on their ability to cooperate together. And if you think about the process, each one has to recognize its individuality and maintain its own distinctive health and identity and function. But it also has to use that function with an evident awareness of its place in the larger whole and the contribution it makes and the fact that it is dependent on the larger whole and the larger whole is dependent on it. Wow. Do you think there's any possibility that we who consider ourselves the highest and most intelligent of life forms might figure out how to do that with each other? <laughs> A very, very interesting question to pursue. These are all areas, you know, uh, not long ago, I guess a lot of physicists still, still maintain this, they say, well, there's this last little particle we haven't discovered. And if we just find that little microscopic particle, we will understand everything. Well, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> You know, the real frontier of science is coming to terms with how little science actually does understand, how little we understand as a species, how much further we have to go to plumb the depths of reality and understanding, and recognizing that, yes, part of that is mechanism and chance, but we also have to recognize the role of conscious intelligence and its role in this incredible process of self-organization. And we need... And if we are to behave in that way, that is the framework of democracy, of intelligent, caring human beings, each making decisions within a larger process of collective decision making to create and maintain the health of the whole of society. Now, if we're going to have real democracy, we've got to break out of the grip of, uh, the grip of corporate rule. We need, as I mentioned, we need to promote redistribution. We need to promote cooperative worker ownership, living wages, safety nets, citizenship education, and a radically uh, progressive tax structure. Anyhow, we need to, uh, to move into, I want to have an engaged conversation here in the group and Q&A and uh, get your feedback. Um, if you want to go further into the implications of the application, I do urge you to get a copy of Change the Story, Change the Future. It is a very short book. It is the shortest book I've ever written, and it is also the easiest to read, and it covers absolutely everything. <laughs> uh, so a lot of, you know, it's the first book I've ever had that people say, yeah, I've already read it twice, and I'm planning to read it some more times. Um, anyhow, we're, you know, there, there are groups that will be out in the lobby that are working for constitutional amendment on, uh, to, to nullify Citizens United, get rid of this ridiculous concept of person, corporate personhood, work on the tr TPP trade agreements, um, all these different aspects, campaign finance reform, uh, standing against coal trains, standing against the Shell, shell uh, service facility. These are all ways to contribute. So. In summary, we are living beings born of and nurtured by a living earth itself born of a living universe continuing to unfold toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility. We are creation's most daring experiment in reflective consciousness. We have a capacity far beyond that of any other species to choose our future. 
We each thereby hold a commensurate responsibility to all within our means to bring our species into alignment with creation's deep purpose. We're the ones we've been waiting for. Go forth. Let us create a new story and a new future. Thank you. My question is, is what advice, what, what can we tell peop, young people that they can go and get out there and do in order to start moving this uh, structural change that needs to happen in our society? What, 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 can, we, what can we ask them to, to, to do, do you think? Yes. You know, it's interesting, the, you, know, you mentioned the iPhone 22, and of course, uh, that's all part of maintaining corporate power. The whole idea that, you know, our service as citizens, our, you know, remember after 9-11? what George Bush has made an instruction to us? Yeah, be patriotic, be American, go shopping. Yeah. Don't ask why do why so many people in the world hate us. Um, don't ask how did the administration allow this tragedy to happen, go shopping. Um, and you know, that's, that's part of it. Now, I, I sense that more and more young people are coming to uh, recognize that consumption itself is in fact not a path to happiness. Um, you know, the main thing that, well, one of the important things we all need to do um, is work on creating the new, bringing the new forward. Uh, one, of, one of my experiences was participating in the formation of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, Bali. There's a chapter here in Seattle. Uh, our whole concept there is that one way to fight the corporate system and this concentrated Wall Street ownership is to rebuild local economies with local businesses that are owned, rooted in the community, and that you know you, you have to make a profit to survive as a business, but you can also the, the goal is to make sufficient profit to survive, meet my needs for survival, while at the same time contributing to the environmental and social health of the community with honest wages, uh, being environment you know environmentally healthy products and all of that. So. One of the critical things that young people can do is find ways to participate in the creation of the new living economy by doing it. Um, you can also, whatever you do, be very open and explicit that this is what I am engaged in as part of a larger story. Whether it's about racial justice, it's about you know, the militarization of police, it's Black Lives Matter, uh, it's about uh, cleaning up rivers, creating bike lanes. All of these things are part of the path to this new essential vision. And you know, one of one of the things where our education system is so such an incredible failure is that very explicitly our institutions of higher education are devoted to preparing you to go to work for the corporate predators to serve their needs. And of course, in the process of your education, we're burdening you with this incredible debt that can keep you in debt for the rest of your lifetime, which forces you into serving the Wall Street robots. Oh, I don't have an answer to that, but boy, we have got to do something about student debt and of course, a key part of that is that comes from corporations not paying their share, share of taxes, uh, bleeding resources from our institutions of higher learning, and you know, financing with your lives. Um, anyhow, there's no simple answer to your question. It's, it's about everything. <laughs> it's about everything. And, and of course, what we should be preparing you to do is recognizing that your generation here as students my generation has left you with one hell of a mess. And your future depends on your leadership in creating the new. And if your higher education was worth anything, 
It should be preparing you for leadership in that transformational challenge. I'm interested in your thoughts, though, on yeah. change from within versus change from outside, and divesting yeah. and stepping out versus moving in and right. trying to change the organization. Yeah, very interesting question, very, very foundational. Um, I use the term money-seeking corporate robots. Uh, that is a very intentionally chosen frame. And it's one I developed further in When Corporations Rule the World. By the way, I've, you know, the original came out in 1995. We have a 20th anniversary edition coming out with some chapters that update it. But this is, a, in terms of understanding the process of change, this is absolutely essential. The financiers, the CEOs of the big corporations, the billionaires, look like they're actually in charge. They're not. They work for a system that is beyond even their control. And as long as they serve that system, they are well rewarded. But most of our biggest corporations are publicly traded. The power is in the ownership shares. Those ownership shares are mediated through these Wall Street institutions, these in, in the global casino, that their whole job is to maximize financial returns by whatever financial games they're able to play. And part of understanding Wall Street is increasingly recognizing that only the most minute fraction of what Wall Street actually does produces anything of real value. The whole, the whole thrust of Wall Street is creating money out of nothing without the burden of creating anything of value in return. I'm concentrating that in a few hands. And even the, even the billionaires and the, the CEOs and so forth cannot at least individually change that. If they all rose up together and said, wow, this, this, this system really sucks. We're destroying humanity. We're uh, destroying democracy. We're destroying everything that's meaningful in life. We've got to take this whole thing apart and reorganize it. Um, they could perhaps do something. But the individuals are helpless. Um, now, on the divestment thing, this is, uh, this is where there's a potential intersect. Um, that I want to share with you. It's a very, a very new idea, at least to my knowledge, but it's, it's one of the most powerful transformational ideas that I've come, up, come across. What if all the retirement plans, which is something I believe, if I remember the figure, something like seven trillion dollars in, uh, in retirement plans, all of which are supposed to be generating returns for you know, people to live in their elder years. <laughs> How many here? <laughs> um, those funds are invested through these Wall Street speculators, the hedge funds, the private equity funds, and so forth, that are simply in the business of exploiting, extracting whatever they can in order to make money out of nothing. So it's a fundamental conflict of responsibility, fiduciary responsibility. Are we supposed, to, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm a retirement fund manager, is my moral obligation to make as much money as possible for my retirees? Or is it to make sure that the money I'm investing is actually benefiting society in the larger sense? Now, the current culture, and this is true for, you know, you'll get this from most uh, foundation executives or managers of university endowments. The answer is my moral responsibility is to maximize financial returns so we can do good with that money. Yeah, that's nonsense. Here's the suggestion. It's called the Evergreen Direct Investment. What if these retirement funds and the endowment funds, like for this university, got together and said, let's organize a program where we pool our funds. We go out and do what the private equity funds do. We buy out those corporations that are, that at least could be making useful products and producing a reliable cash flow 
return that fits with our payment obligations. Buy them out, create a deal with management. You know, as long as if you're if you're willing to manage this organization responsibly to the benefit of workers, the benefit of society, benefit of the environment, and provide us with a fair and steady return, you can stay on as managers. If you don't, we'll replace you. That is then fulfilling their true fiduciary responsibility to society, and it is potentially the most powerful transformational force I can imagine, which is, you know, in a quasi-inside sense, but it's kind of working from the margins to use the tools, the, the system's tools against itself on a very large scale to transform it. So maybe you can get that going here out of Seattle University. <laughs> we have a deadline with this um, and whether or not I buy the iPhone 22 or not. Or yeah. if we divest from fossil fuel companies, I don't know that that will be sufficient in terms of a response that is needed. Um, and then we saw, you mentioned the 1999 World Trade Organization protest where there were so many people who came and made a response. And I don't know that that's ultimately made any impact. Um, yeah. What do you suggest? So, <laughs> I, I, I know that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Is there anybody here that doesn't, from time to time, get a little depressed and feel like it's hopeless? I want you to know I share that. I mean, people often ask me, do you think there's any possibility we can actually change? Well, my response to that is, well, if I look at it as an objective academic observer, we haven't got a chance in hell of getting out of this. It's already too late. We're in too deep. Then I remind myself that if we take that as our assumption, we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes absolutely certain, that outcome. And that is an intolerable outcome. It is an unacceptable outcome. So I have to do everything I can based on the assumption that it is not too late, based on the assumption that it is possible to change, to create a new reality. Now, another... <laughs> another piece of that it's a whole lot more fun getting together with friends, creating the new reality, than it is sitting around being cynical and depressed. Also, at 77 years old, I've lived through a bit of history. And I've seen some incredibly dramatic changes take place very quickly. You know, racism, racial segregation, racial domination goes way, way, way back again to the beginning of empire. The suppression of women goes back to the beginning of empire. If you're going to have a hierarchy, a dominator system, you've got to have most people on the bottom. So who are you going to put on the bottom? Well, if you can just have, you know, skin color and gender and so forth, they're all on the bottom. Uh, that makes it a whole lot easier for us white guys on the top. Okay, we're not through with that, but oh my, the changes that have happened in my lifetime in terms of gender relations and racial relations. Huge. Um, we saw the Soviet Union collapse in the blink of an eye. We saw the end of apartheid in South Africa. Going back to just after World War II, India totally dominated by the British inspired by Gandhi sitting at his spinning wheel. The Indians freed themselves from the most powerful empire in the world. Wow. All happened very quickly. The forces for change build. It's sort of like tectonic plates. And then there's a sudden shift. Um, the... 
The, it all has to do with a moment of readiness. Now, you mentioned the, the WTO demonstration. Did it have any impact? It had an enormous, enormous impact. First of all, it began to, it, it developed awareness all around the world of the insidious nature of these trade agreements, what free trade is really about. But also following the Seattle, well, the Seattle WTO demonstrations, which literally shut down the negotiation, shut down the meeting, prevented any progress toward that further consolidation of corporate rights. That inspired people all around the world. For the next two years, every place the elites met to conspire, to roll back democracy and human rights in favor of corporate rule, hundreds of thousands, in some instances millions of people came out to stop that. Now what happened? Well, it actually got all got disrupted by 9-11, which those of you who were of an age to be aware of what was going on at that time, you know, our government came forward and said, you know, any act of, of, uh, of dissent is terrorism, siding with the terrorists. And there's all sorts of crackdowns around the world. And it scattered the movement. The movement was also built around uh, a focus on these economic issues and specifically corporate rule. But our government at that time, they were talking about Pax Americana, about, you know, American empire opposing democracy by military force, if you can imagine anything more contrary, contradictory. Um, that had the impact of essentially shutting down uh, the movements. We also realized that another part of that is we had created a story around which people organized. They knew what the enemy was. They knew what to attack, what to respond to in terms of the corporate rule and the, 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 this process of globalizing corporate power. Um, but we were in a new situation that it was back to imposing empire by military force. And we had no kind of framing story of what's the strategy to get out of that. And my sense is that Partly what happened at that point was a deflecting of energy that a great many of us turned away from the street protest and turned into these initiatives, you know, rebuilding from the local, creating the new rather than resisting the old. Um, now, we've actually got to come back and we've got to do both at the same time. Uh, but, but that is possible and certainly from my perspective, being very much a part of the movement that built up toward w the WTO protest and beyond. Um, WTO protest had a huge impact, even though uh, it was not <coughs> sufficient. And of course, as you named, none of the things you named are sufficient. Um, everything must change. We have many initiatives. We need to continue with those, both the resistance and the proaction but we also have to bring it together into a larger framing story so that we each see how our individual contributions connect to the contributions of others. What we found recently within this, uh, the laws of the state of Washington is that there are, uh, there's the ability to work through what they call alternative learning experience, ALE, which allows for, uh, it allows for the creation of new curriculum that uh, is a kind of a hybrid homeschool slash public school model. And, and you know, I think frankly, that that's, that's far enough outside of my area of expertise that I can't be very helpful, but I'm sure Kim could. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Now, just coming back to the issue of the story, uh, you know, the thing I've learned in my experience is that timing is everything. There, there is a moment around each of our issues where there is a readiness in society for deep change and for a new conversation. And I'm getting all sorts of signals that this is a time for a discussion about the deeper story. And it may sound like, well, it's kind of a diversion. That's a little woo-woo. I mean, we got to you know, get out on the street. But the power of the story, I mean, that was, that was what, I, you know, what I learned through the International Forum on Globalization, which was the group that we worked together to change the fundamental story about corporate globalization, free trade, 
and these agreements, which of course were all telling us, you know, it's going to be great, good jobs, we're going to defend the workers, we're going to heal the environment and so forth, uh, spread democracy, and all nonsense. We, you know, we got a group of some 40 people redefined that story, took it out into the world. People mobilized on a massive scale because there was a readiness at that point in time for a new story in action. People everywhere are recognized that the current system doesn't work. The old stories make absolutely no sense. If you lay out the sacred money and market story, as I did tonight, everybody gets it instantly. Well, there's a few people that don't, but those, <laughs> those uh, yeah, we just got to move them aside. Um, but also, the, you know, the readiness for this deeper examination. What is the purpose of our lives? Why are we here? What is the nature of our reality? How do we pull together all these findings at the leading edge of science to make sense of them in a larger way? If there's ever a moment in human history for that, it is right now. The, I gather you agree that you're all looking for that story. <laughs> the, the two persons who asked it before me give a kind of a talk before asking their question. Uh, I hope I will be brief and uh, ask specific questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I am not a cynic. I am I am an optimist by nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is something missing in what you are saying. Uh, maybe Probably you, a did, lot. you did not mean to miss it, but I am actually afraid that uh, we have become in America here so self-centered that we also think that the solution is when we become aware and they change our system. The trouble is our system is built by the power through the entertainment industry mm -hmm. to make it far more enjoy watching a stupid game mm -hmm. than actually to have a meaningful conversation and yeah. then talk about what is the meaning of my life and your life and stuff like that. Yeah. In Seattle here last year, the opener, the opening game of the Seahawks, the parking spots around the stadium were for hundred dollars each. Mm. Like the people did not even want to leave the car at North Gate or something and then take the bus. No, no, no. They were willing actually to pay $100 to park the car because their asses has to be as close as possible to where the stadium is. So you got an inside connect? How can I buy some of those parking spots? Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, my, my point is, my yeah. point is, uh, uh, through Hollywood and the entertainment, we have actually showed or uh, made the whole world think that success is to be like that, is to be like yeah. America. Yeah. Now, That's China, all part is of the putting, sacred money China, China is putting a million more cars on the streets every year, a million more cars. Or, yeah. uh, Ch uh, India will follow through, and the rest of the world, where I came from, people dream of living the Hollywood style. Yeah. So the issue now is not just us. No, 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 I think the damage we have done goes way beyond just our little system here in America. Uh, oh, how, how, do we, how do we address that, actually, given that uh, the power of the entertainment industry is far more uh, uh, persuasive than people re reading a book or something? That, that's my uh, number one question. Number yeah. two is, I had some <laughs> hope, I had some hope here in America mm -hmm. a few years ago when something called Occupy Wall Street happened. Yeah. And then I kept going to uh, uh, Westlake Park every evening and then watching people developing this stupid sign language. Of, and then the, the whole thing became like a balloon. It just disappeared and nothing happened. So, and then people say, oh, there is no leadership. The people did not really know what they want to replace the existing system with. Well, well how, how do you deal with this? Like, when the next collapse of Wall Street okay. happens, how do we deal with it? Again, Occupy is a very interesting example. It put inequality on the map. It brought that into the conversation in a way it was never there before, and it's still there. 
course, because inequality is getting even worse. But, uh, you know, in the deeper, we need to keep this deeper perspective in mind that some of these things, I mean, if you understand the history of 5,000 years of empire, it took us literally 5,000 years as a species to get into the mess that we're in. It's not going to end with a single demonstration. And it gets back to the story. Now, I didn't really mention, you know, Fran and I spent most of our adult lives working internationally. This is Fran here. <laughs> The publisher of Yes Magazine. Uh, <laughs> we spent literally 21 years of our lives living abroad in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, working in development to end poverty. So, you know, we've, we've got pretty good feel for that. And the reason we came home was because we realized that the problems we went to solve over there start here. And of course, a big piece of it is what you just outlined. That message, spreading our role and spreading around the world, the sacred money and market story, creating that image of glitter and possibility of consumerism, the idea that economic growth of any kind is the path to universal prosperity. Essentially, the sacred money and market story in the guise of, of economic science. Now, a lot of my sense of the insights about the deeper story actually came from the experience of living in Southeast Asia, Philippines and Indonesia. And the immersion into Asian culture and that deep sense of connection to earth and to family and community, um, particularly in my earliest trips to Asia, the first was back in 1961, and seeing in these rice-based cultures the, just the melding of humans into, the, into nature, this connection with the seasons of people working in community in the fields, this, their ancestors had for thousands of years. Not affluent, not rich, but basically very healthy, strong, deep communities. And that's, you know, that's part of, the, of my own awakening of my consciousness to our, to our real nature and possibilities. And the question is, can we, can we marry modern technology with these deeper beliefs so that we're not being ruled by technology or driven by profit, but using the most, the, the beneficial aspects of it to create a wholly new civilization that works with nature, helps Earth heal these systems, but ultimately actually increases the generative capacities of Earth in support of life, in support of all life. And that is part of our human contribution. So again, I, you know, I, I, I share your despair, and uh, nobody can get more cynical than I can. Uh, ask Fran. <laughs> but uh, you know, we have to touch the center of possibility in our core. And the more we recognize our true nature, and the true nature of the unfolding of creation, and where we fit into that, the more I have a sense of possibility. And I, you know, I just think that there, the vast majority of humans are, are ready to hear that message. But of course, the places you're talking about, nobody is, nobody is even uh, talking about that message. And that's, you know, that's what we need to encourage. <laughs>